Well, thank you for the opportunity. I, I thought, John, when I was watching that clip, that uh, I'm sure I saw the recently deceased actor uh, Alan Wickman, Rickman in it, um, and in some other roles as well. Uh, I don't know whether he was quite shocked or he uh, started a career in medicine and went into comedy, uh, but whatever. Um, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, and I, I was struck, I suppose, uh, when David Mates spoke um, uh, earlier uh, with reference to uh, glasses and uh, about having to put them on and take them off. And I guess there's sort of a difference between David and myself is that David, the risk for David and for myself if I did that uh, would be uh, trying to find them um, in the first place. The risk for me if I did that is that once I found them, I couldn't remember what I wanted them for. Uh, I don't think David's in that space yet, thank goodness. Uh, this is just a quick summary, and I did talk to this, uh, some of you last year about uh, what, what we are. And it is being a union that defines us. Uh, we do negotiate, and we're currently doing that at the moment through some unusual processes, uh, uh, our National Collective Agreement covering all SMOs and uh, uh, industry health boards. Uh, our, our membership is not confined just to those who are specialist or vocationally registered uh, to uh, essentially non-specialist doctors as well in terms of medical officers, uh, sometimes known as MOSSES. Our membership density of permanently employed SMOs, industry health boards, are, uh, is 90% is, is plus. We do actually represent, I've got salary DHBs, that's supposed to be salary GPs, um, but we do represent uh, an, an, a growing number of members, 200 or so plus, uh, who are employed outside district health boards and non-government organisations essentially, primarily, uh, such as uh, um, community health trusts that run services, usually employing GPs, but sometimes rural hospital uh, medicine doctors. Um, we're the second biggest association of doctors in the country outside the G College of GPs uh, of uh, fee-paying doctors, uh, working doctors. And uh, as was indicated, uh, our, our brief is actually quite, quite wide. Uh, it's, you know, paying rations obviously is critical to what we do, but the role is well beyond that. So... What I want to focus on here in clinical leadership is really um, what it means in, uh, is, is really primarily about specialists in public hospitals. And this is where clinical leadership is the most difficult to achieve uh, because much of what uh, public hospitals do is what the rest of the system is not able to do for various reasons and refer to in some way, electives, diagnostic, uh, acutes, emergencies, and um, and, and uh, pop, uh, population health. Now, <clears throat> there are, uh, th 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 these are highly complex and um, integrated institutions. In my view, they should be regarded given what they, they're tasked with and the way in which they're inadequately resourced as, as national treasures. Now, there are two forms of clinical leadership. The first is formal. Uh, these are formal positions of heads of department, clinical directors, um, and, and, and chief medical officers, and other titles that are sometimes used. It's not unusual that uh, through it, it, many senior doctors uh, will, in the course of their career, hold some form of formal clinical leadership position. Most of the doctors, for example, on our national executive, have either currently are clinical leaders of some description or have been, and those that haven't and aren't probably will be at some point in their career. So it's not uncommon, but uh, invariably they attract additional remuneration. They usually involve still doing some level of clinical work and are either permanent or fixed-term appointments. In most cases, holders of these positions have a parachute clause, which means you are, you're able to return to your previous full clinical position when you've decided or someone else has decided that your time is up in that role. They're important, but they're not as important as the second form, which is distributive clinical leadership. And that's leadership that is distributed throughout much of the senior medical workforce, <clears throat> including in their own service and organisation-wide. And that's very much the kind of things that, uh, that David Mates was uh, actually referring to in his address 
earlier. Uh, this might be a range of quality improvement initiatives or systems improvement prospects. It's obviously important for quality standards of, of patient care, but it's also important for fiscal responsibility. To put it in a nutshell, what makes good clinical sense also makes good financial sense. If, for example, DHBs controlled the rate of acute admission increases and reduced the level of clinical variation, the patient gain in financial savings would be immense. But DHBs that can't do this effectively and sustainably without the clinical leadership of medical staff. And I think it's a, the, the reality is, in terms of a DHB as a whole, as distinct from parts of DHBs, this DHB here is, I think, advanced most down that direction by way of contrast. Now, in terms of innovation, first of all, I just want to be clear, this is not an attack on te technology. Um, even though I'm completely frustrated with my very new iPhone that has somehow managed to disable most of my apps, or a number of my apps, including the Air New Zealand one just prior to boarding a plane this morning. So I still regard technology as a positive, although also, at the same time, a binary irritant. Um, but to understand the, the importance of clinical leadership, you need, need to first understand what are the main factors that drive innovation and health. In my view, they are, in summary, workforce, distributed clinical leadership, and technology. Workforce is central because the health system is labor intensive. It is this labor that produces the value. This labor in, uh, intensity provides an inexhaustible supply of creative intellectual capital, including potentially for systems improvements. This is not just specialists, but given the highly specialised nature of their training and work, reinforces their cognitive, uh, reinforced by their cognitive attributes, makes them central. This leadership, clinical leadership, or distributed clinical leadership, I should say, enables this to happen. It puts the wider senior medical staff uh, work for, uh, in the engine room of decision making not simply for their patients, but also for improving services and their DHB and how their DHB functions. Specialists are er experts in addressing the challenges of complexity. They are natural problem solvers. It doesn't take a large quantum leap to extend this skill from the complexity of patient care to the complexity of integrated systems between, commu uh, between community and hospital, uh, such as the pathways in this DHB, uh, uh, between hospitals and within hospitals. Putting workforce capacity, that's time linked, to the, uh, time linked to the supply of positions to one side for the moment, the extent to which this happens is, depends on the extent to which there is an embedded culture of workforce engagement. So workforce is intellectual capital or capacity and distributed leadership is the engagement culture that provides the opportunity to unleash this capacity. And again, that kind of resonates with the message that David was giving earlier. The third driver is technology, but perspective is required. Technology enables rather than drives improvement and, uh, and innovation. Technology loses effectiveness without the intellectual capacity and, and, and culture to, to operationalise it. So the results of a survey done by ourselves um, uh, and published in the New Zealand Medical Journal recently suggest that 80% of DHB senior doctors routinely work through illness with three quarters suggesting that they have turned up to work with an infectious illness. Now presenteeism is, is that is what presenteeism, working when you shouldn't be working because of your health. This is in the context of a, a workforce who, uh, we have who have a negotiated entitlement in the collective agreement for a largely open-ended uh, sick leave entitlement. The average number of sick days reported by the survey respondents was less than three days per annum. Qualitative comments in the survey over why senior doctors feel pressured to work when they were sick provide several insightful observations, some of which are, d are dramatic and, st and, and distressing. They suggest that presenteeism is affected by workplace structural factors and availability of cover, such as availability of cover, 
idealised and gendered norms about what is being part of a medical profession and diverging views on what constitutes an acceptable threshold for taking sick leave. Presenteeism is both a symptom and a consequence of an overworked and overstretched workforce. We also undertook a survey of a burnout amongst DHB employed senior doctors last year and this has been published in, in the BMJ Open, and it revealed an alarming rate of burnout, a reported burnout of 50%. The re results were severe everywhere, including gender, age, and the size of the DHB. But they were particularly severe in middle-sized DHBs, such as, if you're looking at the South Island as an example, Nelson Marlborough, compared with smaller DHBs such as the West Coast and South Canterbury, and larger DHBs such as Southern and here. They were also more severe amongst younger rather than older specialists, especially younger females. To, to express it graphically, if you require a cardiac operation, uh, the results suggest the chances are high, perhaps 50%, that the surgeon opening you up is burnt out, the specialist anaesthetising you and handling your pain management is burnt out, the cardiologist managing your care is burnt out, and the pathologist or radiologist providing the diagnosis essential for a successful operation is also burnt out. The chances are noticeably higher if any one of those specialists are uh, uh, younger or female. This is not scaremongering, it's the reality of what we believe to be everyday life. The prospects of these specialists having the time to be engaged in the best benefits of distributed clinical leadership are severely impeded, if not impossible. Other research we've undertaken suggests that official DHB data on specialist vacancies is misleading with, and, and significantly understates the size of the problem. Official vacancy rates are only those positions that DHBs elect to advertise. We know that the advertised ro uh, roles are, few, are, are, are far fewer than what the system needs to sustain safe, success accessible services delivered through patient-centred care. And the high rates of presenteeism further illuminate the pressures that the senior medical workforce is under to maintain service provision. Yet to be published research, um, yet to, uh, sorry, um, yet to be published uh, research by ourselves into specialist workforce intentions uh, reveals that, uh, that around a quarter of respondents to, an, um, to another one of our surveys is either likely or extremely likely to leave the DHB workforce in the, over the next five years. The conc this conclusion is consistent with the Ministry of Health's own internal modelling of the vocationally registered workfor medical workforce. I've been attending meetings with senior management and our, our own delegates and several DHBs over the last couple of months where this has been discussed. In these discussions, I've identified two main reasons for this, uh, this, this alarming discovery largely beyond the control of DHBs. The first is, like the rest of society, the senior medical workforce is ageing, the same can be said for the GP workforce, and many simply wish to retire. They've concluded that they're at an age and a time in their life where this is the right decisions, and DHBs can do little about this, if anything. The second is the difficulty of and reluctance of many to continue to, uh, with providing acute after-hours care which is unavoidable in most public hospital branches of medicine. A little can be done about this, but because this involves taking them out of the after-hours roster or shift, realistically this option is confined to larger services such as anaesthesia in bigger hospitals such as Christchurch, and then only to an extent. However, while I was correct about the, my, the first reason, wanting to retire from medicine completely, I was wrong about the second. My designated second is important, but it falls behind something else. The something else is job satisfaction. This, as it turns out, and it did surprise me, is the second main reason, and it is avoidable. Excessive workloads and a lack of sufficient engagement culture in DHBs are significant contributors to this dissatisfaction. Many of these doctors have employment op options outside DHB employment. Some can go overseas. 
Some can work in the private sector. They already, already are and they can increase that work or maintain it or they can take up new opportunities. Some can locum at their choice where the market, market heavily favours the supplier rather than the purchaser of labour. And some can work for non-government organisations or agencies such as ACC. Combined, the high rates of presenteeism and burnout, as well as the high level of intentions to leave DHB-based employment, suggest a workforce under stress where senior doctors are torn between a, senior, a high level of commitment to their patients, um, to their colleagues, and to sustaining the, the New Zealand public health system. Sitting behind this is an undersupply of specialist positions in public hospitals, worsened by the pending loss of specialists over the next five years at a rate higher than those coming into the system to replace them. Through neglect, DHBs have allowed a situation to develop where entrenched hospital specialist shortages have become the norm. In the absence of sufficient insight and responsible leadership, uh, this situation is, is, is trending in the wrong direction. What about Health Workforce New Zealand? Well, that almost sounds like a rhetorical question in a way. But in 2000, late 2014, it presented a report, the role of, the, of, of Health Workforce of, uh, New Zealand, uh, called the role of Health Workforce New Zealand. And the Health Workforce New Zealand is the government's official work advisory, workforce advisory body sitting within the Ministry of Health. Um, it identified in that report public hospital specialists as vulnerable and advised that the impact of prolonged labour market shortages of DHB employed senior doctors on workloads, well-being and productivity was the most important issue for its medical work task force to address. What's happened since that time, since late 2014? Short answer is nothing um, to address this parlour state, except to improve uh, the medical work, workforce database, and that is in actually quite a good state. And this is though this lack of this inaction is despite the discovery of the extent of presenteeism and burnout amongst this particular workforce and their intentions over the next five years. Now I want to digress a little bit um, to um, what New Health Workforce New Zealand has been, um, um, has been doing. Instead of addressing um, the, uh, the state of the workforce, they, the way I would put it is that they, they got overexcited about stuffing, the, stuffing up the way that we fund vocational medical training. They appear intent on radically restructuring our funding model for vocational training by seeking to replace our underfunded, more professional college-based system translate college based for uh, clinically led, um, with a still underfunded but highly bureaucratic, excessively transaction cost and business uh, and, and expensive business like edifice. The, mo the model would be based on a phase contestability process in which, college to, uh, in which the college dimension is significantly diminished. Now put this in the context of what David Mates was saying earlier and I would translate a lot of what David was saying is that this particular DHB has shifted from a contractual way of doing things, high transaction cost, you are governed by what's in the contract, to relational. And that means essentially it's about relationships between a range of organisations. The particular advantage in Canterbury is that you do have one main GP voice to talk to, that other DHBs don't always have that same luxury. But nevertheless, it is relational, not contractual, and it means that you can focus on the business of doing things rather than the contractual, you know, the contractual arrangements that sit around that. And Health Workforce New Zealand, regrettably, has, has, has learnt nothing from that at all. Contrary to the principles of clinical engagement, this proposal from Health Workforce is being pushed through by a cabal of um, uh, Health Workforce and minister, Health Ministry officials, officials <laughs> Uh, with selected uh, DHB representatives, including their shared services agency, DHBSS, as support parrots. It appears that those DHB representatives in this process may not be representative of wider DHB views. Certainly, chief medical officers who should have been at the centre of this piece of action are sidelined. The wider medical profession is marginalised in this process to the status of a frustrated bystander. It is all about bureaucratic capture and empire building. 
It has all the hallmarks of a, fias a messy fiasco with significant unintended consequences and a major stoush between the health bureaucracy and the medical profession, but that's a subject for another presentation. But it is the kind of leadership that you have when you are not having leadership. For the, over the last two decades, health ministers, and there's been a few, have um, sent out annual letters of expectations to DHBs, what the minister expects for them over the coming financial year. Uh, in, the, in the first half of the, 2000, the last decade, the then health minister, who was there for six years, used this vehicle to emphasise the importance of clinical leadership. It was good, but it wasn't enough. The next health minister... David Cunliffe, made a significant difference in his brief 12 months in the portfolio in the election defeat until, until the election defeat in 2008. The outcome was a relationship agreement um, between ourselves and the DHBs called Time for Quality. It took clinical leadership to a new level with its focus on the distributed nature of it. Its engagement principles will also, were also incorporated into our national collective agreement with the DHBs. One of these principles states that in respect of service design, configuration and delivery, the role of management was to support the lead role of senior doctors in each DHB as a contractual obligation. In opposition, Tony Ryle picked up on our advocacy of clinical leadership and pursued it with a passion. As Health Minister, he quickly assembled a working group to prepare policy advice on clinical seat leadership, which he then endorsed. It was titled In Good Hands. It was different in style from the Time for Quality Agreement, but it was broadly consistent with it, with a shared emphasis on the distributive side of clinical leadership. In Good Hands further deepened this emphasis. However, many in DHB leadership gave lip service to this policy advice and watered it down to, its, to, to guideline status and then proceeded to file it. Tony Rao continued to emphasise the importance of clinical leadership in his annual letters of expectations to DHBs, but he appeared to conclude that once his policy advice was sent to DHBs, his substantive job was done and he lost interest in the subject. Now, Karen, this is not supposed to be a criticism, but this is not the example that I would give of a doctor as a good example of a doctor progressing to minister. Uh, the current minister has been in the role since the end of 2014. Mind you, there aren't, you could go back to the 1930s until you find another example. Um, um, and he began with gusto, and in his first address to, his, to our annual conference in the same year, strongly emphasised his commitment to promoting and adhering to clinical leadership. But that was as good as it got, and he, as he was overwhelmed by the rigour of disinterest and conked out. For the first time since the initiative of Annette King in the early 2000s, Dr Coleman's letter of expectations for the current and, and previous financial years contained no reference to the importance of clinical leadership. The best he could do in his speech to our annual conference last year was to call for more specialists in management. Minimalist, um, but that's, that's a minimalist expectation uh, and well short of the mark of what is required to improve the quality, uh, for improved quality and uh, fiscal performance. The Ministry of Health has not been helpful. Um, and I think, Philippa, you will recall some of the rhetoric here from a couple of decades ago. Instead of addressing the vulnerability of its most highly trained spe and specialised workforce, the Ministry has migrated to a different planet, although you might say solar system, with its focus on disruptive innovation as a new lens and toolkit to approach the health system. At a theoretical level, disruptive innovation attempts to understand and analyse why some commercial bus businesses has, have failed while others have thrived. The emphasis on the disruptive power of unanticipated technology, technological development, such as digital photography versus Kodak, Uber versus traditional taxi companies, that have transformed the way in which a business or service has been delivered. But at the heart of disruptive innovation, theoretically, is a, a fundamental belief in market forces 
when applied to the quote, business of healthcare, the view is that the healthcare industry simply needs to open its doors to these high tech market forces to raise the quality of healthcare for everyone. Existing powers, existing powers need to get out of the way to let the market forces play. During this natural, uh, quotes, natural process of disruption can, during this, once this natural process of disruption can proceed, it will be possible to build a new, new health system. This is not me talking. Uh, the disruptive but disruptive innovation is not a new law of nature. Healthcare is generally assumed to be beyond for profit and not an economic growth factory. Further, given that people are not disk drives, it should be questioned whether this theoretical, theoretical premise is appropriate as a discourse to frame a new direction for our health system. In March, I attended a particularly turgid event. It was a two-day health system on disruptive innovation organised by the Health Ministry, in which, in my view, was disconnected with the challenges faced by the DHBs and where technology was seen as the driver rather than an enabler of innovation. There were confusing messages. On the one hand, disruptive innovation was an international threat that would swamp our health system as we, and we had to adapt to it. On the other hand, disruptive innovation was wonderful and we should embrace it. The net result of the Ministry Health's galactic journey is a massive distraction that relegates medical workforce vulnerability and clinical leadership to the giddy heights of unimportance. Now, I um, subscribe to an online facility called Word of the Day. Um, often the words are delightful, amusing, and difficult to remember. But a recent word is unforgettable, throttle bombing, bottom. Just reading the name in isolation suggested to me that it was either a medieval name or a character from a Shakespearean play or a Dickens novel. But this was not remotely close. Instead, it, was, it means a harmless incompetent in public office. For context, it was used in a 1984 biography of an American vice president in the 1960s um, with the following quote. If there was one function that any vice president, even a throttle bottom, could be expected to perform, it was to represent the president and the country of, at funerals of notables abroad. To provide you with some further more irrelevant information, the term throttle bottom was formed after the character Alexander Throttle Bottom, bottom um, in the musical comedy of, of Oh The I Sing in 1932. I don't know whether it's in your repertoire there, John. Um, so, it could be. <laughs> so the question arises, is the health ministry leadership a throttle bottom? They are not incompetent. In fact, they're very competent, hardworking, committed and likeable. But while they're caught in this interplanetary gaze, equally they're not harmless with their obsession with technology as the driver of innovation, rather as an enabler and a focus and focus on disruptive innovation. In other words, the leadership of our central government health organisation and much of our DHBs, I've got to say, are hybrid throttle bottoms. Well, where do you go for advice on um, uh, health sector leadership? I think Rowan Atkinson's, I don't have a video clip to manage, to match um, John's, but Rowan Atkinson's not a bad alternative. Uh, so I went to somebody who, um, and I searched for experts such as Blackadder and Mr Bean, but I didn't find anything from them. But I did find something on a younger uh, Rowan Atkinson, if I can work this. Here we go. <laughs> Can I just hold it? The message in this, by the way, I should have said before, is that what we have essentially is a health leadership that manages to dob, doesn't manage to, to, to dodge one obstacle, but very quickly manages to fall into another. Um, 
that's not a picture of me. Um, but this, my, my, my talk here today may sound pessimistic, um, but I'm actually optimistic. Um, I, I take the lead from my father who said that once that um, um, the cup is always half full, but if you're in any doubt, just put a drop of whiskey in it, and it will be. Um, uh, but I don't think it's necessary to have the drop, although probably for many it does. Uh, but I'm optimistic that the day of clinical, distributed clinical leadership will come with persistent, cogent, strong, and at times profoundly irritating advocacy. To understand where we need to go, we also need to understand what the obstacles are preventing us, beginning with a an, serious undersupply of specialist positions in DHBs. It's, role, it's a role of advocacy, uh, of the ASMS and its advocacy. But one of the things that is exciting, I think, is the, um, um, the, the, the developing relationship between ourselves and MSA in terms of different ends of the spectrum. And I think that if the different ends of the spectrum are able to be part of the joined up advocacy, uh, then our strength is considerably greater. Um, and I would hope that it would become your role, regardless of your branch, branch of medicine where, and where you end up, including in general practice. Uh, but because after all, a high quality public hospital is a source of comfort for general practitioners themselves. So in speaking to you today, I'm reminded of a 19th century remarkable uh, 19th century English activist, William Morris, who was the ultimate multitasker. Tasker, tasker. He was a textile designer, novelist, architect, poet, translator, and when he had nothing else to do, he was a socialist activist. And what he said at a meeting of, um, uh, in England, he told his audience, I'm not here to let you be contented with too little. And I'll just end on that note. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian, right. for providing us with a little taste on the status quo of the system um, and what associations like ASMS do mm. um, to address this. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, we see a couple. Of, oh, a couple of questions. Can I speak about that? Ian, I was just wondering after that talk from David Meeks and how mates, mates, oh, sorry. mates, yeah, mates, yeah. mates, and how impressive the organisation and the integration of you know, the students, the young staff, and the older staff. Is there any indication in Christchurch DHB that retention is higher? Um, I. Uh, in terms of the intentions to leave the workforce, my recollection is the data for Canterbury is very consistent with the national trend. Um, so they have the same, I think it's fair to say, and when we've surveyed on commitment of the, of the, chief, uh, of the DHB to clinical leadership, distributive clinical leadership amongst our members, Canterbury and the coast, West Coast, um, have always rated at the top. Um, so I think it can be say there is a there is to be blunt about it there is a high level of disengagement in Canterbury, uh, and in, in the um, but there's also a high level of engagement as well. And I would say that Canterbury rain um, compares very very favourably. So I think that probably the job satisfaction contribute or dissatisfaction contributor to people leaving will be less here relative to other DHBs. And I don't think the age demographic increases the risk, as I understand it. Yeah. yeah so, um, yes, I definitely sympathise and agree with the point about you know, technology being a <coughs> catalyst or, you know, rather than an initial driver, and essentially. Um, but in terms of sort of increasing and distributing leadership, aside from increasing SMO positions and, I guess, by doing that, you need to increase places on training programs. Mm. Do you have any other sort of ideas or things to which we could advocate for that would facilitate this increased distributed clinical leadership? Well, what um, um, 
what we're actually, I, I can't go into the details of that, we're actually in the, in the middle of a major negotiation at the moment. Um, and uh, we, we've, we've sort of came to an impasse and then we've been trying to find a way through it. Uh, one of the arguments that we've, we've been advocating the vulnerability of the workforce and therefore you need to improve your conditions in order to recruit more to more positions and also retain more. Uh, but we've also said that if you actually free up the time of SMOs, of senior doctors and DHBs, to allow those who wish to be more involved in systems improvement and more involved in uh, other quality initiatives that have a fiscal return to them, as it happens, as consequentially, uh, then you will have a greater capacity uh, to... Um, um, to actually not only improve your, improve your financial performance, etc., um, also a greater capacity to reduce. You'll never reduce reliance on locums. Uh, you'll always need locums. But well, in my view, we're over locumed, if you like, uh, because of because of uh, undersupplied positions. So through a bargaining process, uh, we may be able to actually we'll be carrying that argument there, and we would also even consider amending. We have in our collective agreement a job description clause, generic. And many of the things we seek, we argue, actually are already in that. But there could be an argument for actually putting in there um, a, a, an obligation um, that could be part of a job, an individual senior doctor's job description to be involved in systems improvement. So DHB's obligation to provide the workforce capacity to enable that to happen. So that's at one level. Um, um, I don't think I've answered your question properly, but that's uh, part of it. I don't know. I mean, that's just the way I see it. Oh, sorry, can I just say one other thing, though? Um, none of this works sufficiently without a significant change in culture. And that's cultural shift in leadership uh, is what's got to happen. But one of the things that's happened is that in the last, since 2010, we've had about 1.5 plus billion, a million, sorry, uh, um, billions, I should say, sucked out of the uh, health system. Um, um, in relative terms. Now, um, that's a bit like, in the absence of any in workforce investment strategy, that is simply shock therapy spread over that period of time. And that has actually brought out, in my view, the worst of management in many places. Uh, it encourages management just to focus on those things that sit immediately in front of them. Now, we've got a sh and, and, they, and they get lost on terms of the medium to long term, which is what the system needs, that medium to long term focus. And so we need a cultural shift in, um, um, in, the, in the sort of you know, chief executive and senior management leaders in the DHBs that we have at the moment. The immediate solution is an AK-47, but there are legal impediments to that, as you're probably aware of. So it is going to be a longer haul, but clearly we have to turn around that leadership culture. I think David Mates is, uh, I don't think David's completely there, but he's well in that direction. Uh, and I think the leadership ar around is, reflects that. And the gains are there to be seen. Um, one of the advantages that Canterbury has had is it's had, uh, including even to now, but certainly uh, up until the earthquakes, I think it's had the most stable specialist workforce in public hospitals. And I think a big reason for that is just the nature of Canterbury. I, I, was, I lived here for six years. I was a taxi driver for a couple of years when it was deregulated, so you could earn, uh, sorry, when it was regulated, sorry, when you could earn a bit of money. Um, but, um, you know, it's, um, it's had those natural advantages of being in an attractive city with a big rural hinterland. Uh, you can live reasonably close on a nice lifestyle block or whatever and still be available for acute call. Um, and you've got mountains and beaches close by. So it's had, and that stability, once you get strong retention, retention breeds retention and it strengthens recruitment when you have to recruit. And that's been a big plus and a big reason why the gains have been made. Yeah, and just one last question. Just out of curiosity around that point, um, around financial um, gains associated with these suggestions, um, I've noticed that Canterbury has been in the news a lot about mm. financial aspect and the struggles there. And the, in theory, it sounds like it works, but I'm wondering, can you explain this discrepancy? Or? How do you mean, what do you mean by discrepancy? Uh, I guess it 
sounds like the finances should work out so that it would actually be better with distributed clinical leadership. Mm. One thing can be struggled with is the financial aspect. Oh, yeah, but look, look. part of the catalyst for Canterbury, or a catalyst was, uh, and I think David alluded to it, was in the 2000s, uh, they were saying, we've got to build a new hospital. And if things were going the way they were going, that would have been the answer. Um, uh, the, um, and the way the pathways developed over time became clear that they would not have to build a new hospital. But then there were the quakes. So the, the, uh, I would put it this way, the financial system, first of all, I think that in terms of a local health system, other health systems in other parts of the country would have, would have coped with something like that, but not as well, I believe, as Canterbury did because it was so joined up. That makes a huge difference. And I think the financial position of Canterbury would be much worse than what it is. Canterbury's problems are the quakes. Um, and once the heroics of the quakes themselves were sort of coped with in that, in that really traumatic phase, Wellington and arguably some other DHBs never really grasped the consequences of the aftermath. Uh, for example, the immense pressure on mental health services, really, really big, but not just mental health, and a thoroughly dislocated workforce because of the, 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 the damage to buildings. Um, and so um, there was... and so. You've also had a reason, quite a brave DHB, um, uh, to um, um, uh, actually, as much as they can, because it's not, it's not career enhancing to criticise the ministry and the media, uh, but as much as they can to get that message across. And so it's the response. And our funding system, as David is correct, the population-based formula for funding is actually quite sensible, makes a lot of sense. It's not as transparent as it should be, but no formula can anticipate and adjust to a de an event as devastating in the aftermath as the quake, and that's the answer. I should have warned you that neither David Mates nor myself do brevity very well. <laughs> um, yes, and thank you so much. That's right. There's no other questions for you. No other questions? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you.